You're listening to Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman on the Land of Israel Network. Hello and welcome back to Inside Israel Today here on the Land of Israel Network and thelandofisrael.com. I haven't been here now for three weeks because I was in America on a speaking tour of uh, red states and blue states talking about the uh, the relationship between those red states and the blue states uh, and the Jewish state over here in Israel. It was lots of fun uh, speaking to the wonderful people of Chicago, Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, South Carolina, Florida, Dallas, Seattle, and last but certainly not least, Honolulu. Uh, I got to meet some wonderful people in the four corners of the United States, really four corners, uh, with uh, Hawaii being the lower west corner of the United States, often forgotten, Seattle being the upper west, Miami Beach being the southeast, and in uh, the northeast, I spoke on the upper east side of New York. So didn't go to Maine this time but Upper East Side of New York. I got to see many of people who really, really care about the future of Israel and are, and are very, very concerned. That really connects to what we're going to be talking about in our show today. In the f- first half of the show, we're going to be talking about what I've been reporting now since I came back, which is uh, about a very curious character in Israeli politics, the leader of the Labor Party and the Zionist Union, Avi Gabai. And in the second half of the show, I'm going to go back to my speaking tour and talk about Hawaii. I've been told that Gabai and Hawaii do not rhyme, so uh, we're going to be starting over here with Gabai. So um, Avi Gabai has been saying some controversial things lately. Uh, Just in the last uh, month or so. Uh, Avi Gabai has caused many an uproar. First of all, he said that in any kind of peace agreement, he doesn't think that Jewish communities will need necessarily to be evacuated. You know, that is expected here from the leader of the Israeli left. What are called settlements, I don't even know if we're allowed to use that word on the Land of Israel Network, might end up staying even in any kind of peace agreement that if the left, if Gabai uh, would come to power. Uh, He said, quote, uh, why do you need to evacuate if you make peace? If you make peace, solutions can be found that don't require evacuation. He also said he would not sit in a governing coalition with the joint Arab list, that he's not sure if there's a partner on the Palestinian side. And that, quote, the whole land of Israel is ours because it was promised to Abraham by God. And that statement at the end there about God is certainly not anything you would expect to hear from the leader of the Israeli left. For years, it was the Israeli right uh, that was the representative of uh, those who believed in God and those who believed that all the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. And the Israeli left uh, were the ones that were in favor of territorial compromise for Israel's own good, from their point of view, and did not have too many uh, pre- religious representatives. The ones that there were, were were rare and kind of strange. And so now here comes Avi Gabai. And he decides to reclaim Judaism and Zionism for the Israeli left. Even says yesterday to an audience of students at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev that the left has forgotten what it means to be Jewish. Now that statement, that the left has forgotten what it means to be Jewish, was at first said by Netanyahu, whispering in the ear of a Kabbalist, Rabbi Yitzchak Kaduri, 
back in 1997. And when this was caught on tape by Chaim Rivlin of Israel Radio at the time, um, this caused a big uproar uh, that Netanyahu was delegitimizing half the population at the time. At the time, the left was half the population. Now they're much less, um, in part because of Netanyahu's political success and in part because of the Palestinians and of what they've done to discourage Israelis from believing in peace and, and in part because of poor American leadership now for, for two decades. Um, but this was Netanyahu whispering. He didn't have the courage to say what he believed out loud. And here comes Avi Gabai speaking about his own community and saying it loud and clear. And he's saying it not just tactically to get him votes, but because he really means it. So let's speak about, first of all, uh, why it would get votes and then why he really means it. So when Netanyahu was prime minister the first time, his political strategist was uh, the late Arthur Finkelstein. Arthur uh, canvassed Israeli public opinion, and he found that votes are often decided by whether Israelis see themselves as more Jewish or more Israeli. The ones who considered themselves more Jewish were more likely to vote for Likud, and those who saw themselves as more Israeli were more likely to vote for the Labor Party in its various uh, I- incarnations. Since then, more and more Israelis see themselves as more Jewish than Israeli. What does that mean? It means not necessarily that they're religiously observant, but that they're proud Jews. That They're proud of who they are. They put their Jewish values above liberal values, even though they are very often one and the same, and even though they go together quite beautifully most of the time. When there are conflicts between the two, though, they will choose their Jewish values first, in part because of international pressure on Israel to make concessions uh, that wasn't really backed up by support in the long run. Israelis more and more have have stopped caring about the world and and what the world thinks of them. Uh, You know, Jews and Israelis in in particular always want to look good to the world, but in the end, if there's a choice between looking good and being safe and secure, the people of Israel are choosing to be safe and secure. If the world wants Israel to make certain concessions uh, to people that want to kill us, Israelis are much less willing to do that after certain experiments have not proven successful. And so here comes Avi Gabai, and he appeals to those masses who... uh, maybe in the past, were willing to make concessions and now aren't so much. And those people couldn't have voted for the Labor Party with the policies that had in the past. But maybe if they believe Avi Gabai, if they see him as genuine, even if he sounds like Likudniks do, maybe if they're mad at Likud for various legitimate reasons, they'll end up deciding to vote for Gabai. Um, a lot of it will depend on what candidates he brings in and what candidates he keeps out from his Labour Party list. But uh, I think out of the reactions that there have been since Avi Gabe said it, the most interesting one came from the leader of Shas Arya Deri, who wrote to Avi Gabe praising him for saying what he did and, and, and saying that, that there does indeed need to be more embracing uh, of uh, Jewish values and him ending his comment uh, by saying a word in Moroccan that I, I can't really pronounce, uh, but means you're one of us. That's a very risky thing for Arya Derry to do. Arya Derry's Shas party is uh, teetering on the electoral threshold, and uh, his voters tend to be much further to the right, even though he himself personally is not. And when he goes and compliments 
Abi Gaba and says, you know, you're one of us, I'm from Morocco, you're from Morocco. Um, that means that uh, Gaba is really hitting the nail on the head because, uh, you know, he could end up taking voters away from Shas. I think that Ari Deri is not being smart when he compliments him. Uh, but I think it shows uh, that Abi Gaba's comment, which attracted a lot of attention, was indeed successful. Um, now, what I said before, he, he really means it. Uh, Abi Gaba comes from a Likud family. He formed Kulanu ahead of the last election with Moshe Kachlon, who also sees himself very much as a Likudnik and says it with pride, even though he, he formed his own party. Um, he's not religious. He, uh, his family is. And he has a lot of respect for the religion. And um, he means that the left-wing politicians have gone too far out on a limb and abandoned where a lot of the voters are um, and that they need to return to speaking about their Jewish pride, uh, about Shabbat, and about... Uh, other you know value values that uh, the Jewish people gave to the world. Um, a lot of, he spoke about why socialists tend to be Jewish because of uh, their need uh, to uh, embrace social justice, about some of the values of about workers' rights, about uh, helping minorities, uh, helping the stranger that really do come from Judaism. I think that he really does mean it. Now, he was attacked on the radio this morning by Yair Lapid, who said, don't go telling people who's Jewish and who's not. And that just shows that Lapid is missing the point. Uh, Lapid has also reached out um, to uh, m more religious or, or certainly not anti-religious voters because he has the anti-religious voters in his pocket. He went and he put on a, a, a kippah in the Western Wall. Uh, he had his wife do the mitzvah of hafrashat chala, of removing a, a baking chala and removing a part of it. That was seen as really artificial, even hypocritical. And I think his criticism of Gabai shows that Lapid very often doesn't get uh, what Avi Gabai understands uh, about what a lot of the people of Israel are looking for. Uh, they're looking for this element uh, of Jewish pride, of being able to say to the world, you know, we appreciate your recommendations, but we are who we are, and we're not going to change. We, we, we like being who we are. We are proud Jews. We are proud Israelis. The land of Israel does belong to us. The center-left uh, might want to make concessions on that land for, for whatever reasons, but even if they did, uh, they wouldn't stop loving the land. They w wouldn't stop thinking that it's ours, uh, that if we gave it, we're, we're giving our land. We're not giving land that doesn't belong to us. And that really connects to the other statement that Avi Gabay made last night, which was equally risky. He said when he was asked about being Lapid's number two, not about running under him, in an, uh, ahead of the election, but being Lapid's number two after the election uh, about joining a government led by Lapid, he said, yes, I don't have to be the number one. I don't have a fetish with being prime minister. He said, if Lapid would form the government, uh, then uh, I would be willing to be his number two because Israel needs change. Now, only one of them could be the number one. Only one of them can be the one who gets the bulk of the votes to the right, to the, excuse me, to the left of the Likud. What's been happening over the last few elections is that the public ultimately decides to go with one party, uh, that, that center-left public. And whoever isn't there in that one party doesn't get the votes. It's either going to be Gabay or Lapid right now they're polling very similarly. But what happens ahead of election day is 
they, the voters that are to the left of Likud ask, who can beat Netanyahu? And they go with one of them. So chances are one of these parties is going to have more than 20 seats. And the other one could have only 10. Uh, right now, in the current Knesset, there, there are 24 seats. In the Zionist Union, there are 11 in Yeshatid. The next time, it could be the same, or it could be the opposite. Yair Lapid refused to answer the question of whether he would join a government led by Gabai. Uh, he just said when he was asked about it, I'm going to win the election, and then I'll form a government together with labor and liquid, a unity government, because that's what the people of Israel want. I'm not so sure. The people of Israel want that Jewish pride, and I'm not sure that Lapid can deliver it. If Avi Gabai continues to present himself as this alternative who uh, can appeal to the center, the left, and the right, he might be able to do what Lapid can't do, and that's form a government. Um, so I think Israeli politics are getting more and more interesting as time goes on. We're certainly waiting to see what's going to happen with Netanyahu and the criminal investigations hanging over his head, uh, which are really the only thing that can bring him down, with all due respect to Gabay Lapid and the, the uh, IDF chiefs of staff that are waiting on the sidelines to enter politics at the right moment. None of them could beat Netanyahu right now. Only The only politician who could bring Netanyahu down is Netanyahu himself. His own hedonism, his own hubris uh, that has been revealed more and more by the leaks from the criminal investigations uh, that are surrounding the prime minister and really uh, harming his ability to govern right now. Uh, and I'll just end by saying I found in my talks in America that the people of America, I guess especially wealthy American Jews, really, really don't get these criminal investigations, especially the one about receiving expensive gifts, uh, cigars and, and pink champagne from a rich Hollywood producer. Don't worry, not that Hollywood producer, uh, but from uh, Arnold Milchin, uh, the uh, man who introduced Brad to Angelina in a shidduch, a, um, a, uh, a marital uh, a, uh, setting up that uh, I think lasted longer than most Hollywood uh, shidduchim do. The people hear that Netanyahu has been accused of, of receiving the, these gifts and they're like, great, you know, I want to give him gifts. So what's wrong with giving gifts to the prime minister of Israel? You know, if you host him or... or you're friends with him, of course you want to give him things. And we're, you know, we're, Jews are, are giving people, especially to people who we want to find favor with. And uh, they're coming from a place in America where that's part of the culture and where their own American president, even though he has everything, when he goes abroad, he receives gifts. Uh, Donald Trump went to Saudi Arabia and the Saudis presented him with no less than 50 gifts, including matching bathrobes for him and Melania, made out of the fur of a cheetah. They actually had to go and catch two cheetahs in order cheetahs are fast animals in, in order to get these bathrobes. Netanyahu doesn't have anything made out of cheetah fur, but Netanyahu went a little too far in what he thought was acceptable. And it'll be up to the Attorney General to decide whether that means that Netanyahu can no longer remain prime minister. Um, and if he can no longer remain prime minister, the political field is wide, wide open. Stay tuned to Hira on the Land of Israel Network, on the landofisrael.com, uh, to watch all the excitement as it happens, and of course, to the Jerusalem Post, where I'm proud to work day in and day out, and uh, night in and night out lately. After the break, we're going to be speaking about the 50th state of America and its connection to Judaism, its connection to Israel, its connection to me. We will be going from Gabai to Hawaii 
and I think it does work. Hi, this is Eve Harrow, host of Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. You can hear a new show from me every Sunday and every day of the week. Shows from another one of my very talented fellow show hosts. Reach me, Eve, at thelandofisrael.com. And keep listening, everybody. We love your feedback. The Land of Israel, coming at you every day, every week. That's the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. And we're back here on Inside Israel Today on the Land of Israel Network and thelandofisrael.com where we are going from speaking in the first half about Avi Gabai to speaking in the second half about Hawaii. So um, I had the honor and privilege of spending last week in the most beautiful state in America, uh, one of the most beautiful places in the world outside the land of Israel. We're here on the land of Israel dot com. Of course, always say that the land of Israel is the most beautiful land. It was given to the Jewish people by God, and uh, its beauty cannot be compared to anywhere else. So let's leave the land of Israel out of it for the rest of this show here on the land of Israel network, um, and speak about Chutzlar. It's about the land abroad. Look, I was brought there to speak uh, by the Jewish National Fund. A, we're raising money for the land of Israel, so it's, I guess it's uh, back connected, and that's okay. Um, and I spoke at Temple Emmanuel, a thriving reform temple in the suburbs of Hawaii, of uh, Honolulu, uh, on Oahu. And I found that not only is Hawaii a beautiful, beautiful state, uh, but its people are beautiful as well, and it, and it's it's Jewish people in particular. The community that I found uh, really loves Israel. Uh, they're very proud Jews. Uh, both the um, uh, uh, American-born uh, Jews that are there in the uh, Reform community and uh, the Israelis who attend to go to the Chabad, led by uh, Rabbi Itchel and Pearl uh, Krasniansky, uh, that's uh, right next to a shopping mall that is full of Israelis who work in the uh, kiosks and stalls in, in the middle of the mall uh, and uh, love Israel very much, but are temporarily working there in Hawaii, which is better than I think. I- Working in a place with uh, less good weather, there, the let's just say the, the the kiosks and the stalls in the middle of the Mall of America, in Minnesota are also full of Israelis, and uh, I like to think that they envy the the Israelis who chose the mall in Hawaii over the mall in uh, snowy Minnesota. Um, I'm very excited that I had this chance of going to Hawaii, and even Netanyahu who in the last year and a half, as he bragged in his UN speech, was in East Africa, West Africa, became the first Israeli sitting prime minister to visit Australia and Latin America, was in Singapore, was in Muslim countries, Azerbaijan and and Kazakhstan. Netanyahu has never visited Hawaii, at least not as prime minister. What he's done in his own time in between, we don't know, uh, but I could probably check on that. And so take that, BB. I beat you to Hawaii. I did my best to represent Israel in my talk there. Um, I did my best uh, to display my pride in the state of Israel and my and my Jewish pride there in Hawaii. I'm very thankful to God for this opportunity that I had to speak in 50 states. I believe I am the first Israeli. Uh, to speak in all fifty, to speak in all fifty states about Israel, uh, someone has pointed out that uh, Lenny Solomon of Schlock Rock has performed in all fifty states, and that when he performs, he also speaks about Israel. I don't think it counts. <laughs> I did not sing. I spoke. I'm pretty sure from the reception that I received uh, in uh, Fargo, in North Dakota, and in Jackson, Mississippi, that they haven't had. To Israel speakers 
So I'm, I'm glad that I, I came to all of them and got to see all around America, the red states and the blue states, the, the great variety of opinion that there is, and to really see that Israel is the one issue that can unite Americans today when America is more divided than ever. I want to thank uh, all the people who were involved in being able to reach all these 50 states. I've spoken for many wonderful organizations, uh, really starting uh, with JNF, that's brought me to much of America, uh, APAC, ADL, American Friends of Magen David Dome, the Jewish Federations of North America, Israel Bonds, just recently Shari Tzedek Hospital, Hadassah Hospital, of course, and synagogues across America, Reform, Conservative, Modern Orthodox, and Chabad, with the Chabad movement growing by leaps and bounds, and really reaching out to American Jews all over America in a beautiful kind of way. They beat me to 50 states when they opened their, not necessarily necessary, uh, um, shul in uh, South Dakota, but I beat them to South Dakota and had a great audience there. The uh, Reform Synagogue there, organized by uh, Carol and Steve Rosenthal, wonderful people. I'm very thankful to everyone who has allowed me to make that history, who has uh, enabled me to achieve that kind of success, which I'm not letting go to my head. Hawaii. Hawaii really shows us the world is bigger than all of us. Seeing the beauty of the beaches, seeing the beauty of the water, getting to parasail uh, near a volcano, and think God created this beautiful, beautiful land. It's hard to not believe in God when you see that kind of beauty. Uh, you know, how, how could this have been created just by science and evolution and, and whatever? There had to be some kind of supernatural kind of hand in creating this. And so my belief in God, I think, has been strengthened by seeing so many beautiful places all around America. Uh, you know, not just Hawaii. Miami Beach is pretty nice, too. Uh, People don't realize uh, how beautiful uh, Pittsburgh can be. People don't realize how, how beautiful Little Rock is there uh, on the river. Uh, and the, I'm not a winter person, but uh, Minnesota, uh, Minnehaha Falls over there is also very beautiful. And cities can be beautiful as well, with Chicago being the most beautiful city in America, though I'm uh, kind of biased coming from there. Um, New York. New York is impressive. It's not pretty. So uh, the upstate New York, however, <laughs> is very nice. But New York City, it'll never, as a Chicago, and it, it it it'll never get me. Though I know it gets a lot of people. Uh, so here we are here on the Land of Israel Network on the Land of Israel dot com, uh, speaking about the beauty of America, and. That's important. Uh, most of our listeners are there in America and you can be very proud of the country that you live in. And uh, I recommend seeing all of it. I still recommend living over here. Uh, here in the state of Israel, in the land of Israel, among the people of Israel. Greatest people in the world, greatest land in the world, greatest Torah in the world. So see all of America. Join us over here in Israel. That's my message. It's been a pleasure being with you here. On Inside Israel Today, on the Land of Israel Network, on thelandofisrael.com. Shalom from Jerusalem. <laughs>